One author says that politicians and advocates need to stop blaming institutional investors for the housing issues and instead look at the supply problem. I'm Tony, and this is Real Estate Investing and Landlord News. All right, so I have an interesting topic for you today, and it's going over the whole institutional investor and you know corporate investors and these hedge funds buying up hundreds or thousands of homes at once and how you know lately they've become the scapegoat for all of the ills of the housing market basically people think that hey well there's no houses available to buy for uh, people who want to own or occupy homes because the corporations have bought them all up or they think that oh well these corporations are causing rental prices to skyrocket and now housing is unaffordable for too many people basically you know, they're, they're blaming the institutional investors, the corporations and the large landlords and the small landlords, too, for all of these housing problems. Right. And the truth of the matter is, according to this author, they are not to blame. OK, they are an easy scapegoat for the problem. But the real problem is the housing supply issue. It's a problem that I have brought up many, many times in many of my videos. You know, the laws of supply and demand say that, hey, the more supply we have, if we're able to meet that demand or exceed it, the cost of housing will be lower, okay? And the quality of housing will improve. But, you know, they, the people who don't understand the basic economic, you know, law behind it, you know, they, they think that, oh, well, if we hit these institutional investors hard or if we hit the landlords hard, then that will somehow solve these problems and it won't okay it just will not they will see that pretty quickly after they pass these laws i mean there's so many laws that have been passed in the last year that have been punishing to landlords and what you will see is that they don't solve the affordability problems they don't solve the supply issue okay there's still going to be a housing shortage after you pass a rent control law it might even become worse okay your law actually made things worse i you know, it's frustrating because it seems like to me common sense, you know, it just seems like basic common sense that, hey, these rules you're passing are not going to work. But to these politicians, I, I mean, I think they're idealists because I believe that they truly believe that somehow their law, their policy, their city, their rule is different and it's not. OK, it's the same old garbage that we've already proven doesn't work. So before I get into the article, go ahead, hit the like and subscribe button, maybe leave a comment down below. Let me know what you think, okay? So I know there's a lot of smaller landlords on here who don't have favorable opinions of institutional investors. I also know there's plenty of tenants who watch my videos, hate watch my videos, because you know they don't agree with anything that is positive towards landlords, right? But what is your opinion on these institutional investors? Do you truly believe that they are the, the root cause of these issues or do you believe it's something else, okay? And if you think it's something else, put it down in the comments. Let, let us know what you think. I'm just curious to see what other people who watch my videos, what they believe to be the true issue that's leading to this kind of weird housing crisis we're going through. So let's get into the article. This article is coming from Forbes.com and it says, ownership isn't the problem. Scarcity of housing is. And yeah, it's an opinion article and uh, I actually agree with most of it. So let's get into it. Last month, I attended a community meeting in Cincinnati students of the housing systems course in the University of Cincinnati School of Planning to discuss how institutional investors are impacting our city. What is currently being done to address this issue and what more we need to do. I've posted before about the Port of Cincinnati's efforts to thwart institutional investors buying single family houses in the city. The question that was hard to answer at that meeting was what exactly is an institutional investor and whether ownership is casual, casually related to bad housing outcomes like higher rents, eviction or dilapidation. Worrying about who owns housing seems to be yet another distraction from the real problem, lack of supply in the face of rising demand. Yeah, and that, that's what I personally think it is as well, okay? It's a distraction. 
It's basically, hey, if we complain about these institutional investors, then we don't have to fix the real problem because the real problem is a lot harder to fix. You know, when they look at, hey, we're going to have to stop all these uh, zoning regulations. We're going to have to make it easier for these people to actually build and allow them to build in much, much higher numbers. And a lot of cities, states, municipalities just don't want to do that. They want to make it harder to build. You know, there's they've got this uh, NIMBY attitude, you know, not in my backyard. They they oh, well, we want more housing. We just don't want it anywhere near us. And, you know, I, I don't blame them in some scenarios, but in other scenarios, I'm like, hey, this isn't going to hurt you. This is only going to make things better. Now, I know for a fact that some larger cities, I'm not saying Cincinnati or Cleveland or other cities in Ohio are like this, right? But they don't want to build new housing because they're worried about like gentrification. Okay, that, that that's what I hear out of like New York and San Francisco. They're like, oh, well, we don't want to make it nicer so that, you know, these people can't afford to live here anymore. And I'm like, well, when you don't build new housing, that just makes it more expensive, the housing that's currently there. And that e essentially gentrifies the place without building new housing. So you've basically screwed yourself with your ridiculous policies. Um, yeah, so yeah, I think that the whole worries about who owns the property, you know, if it's an out-of-state investor, if it's a, a corporation or whatever, that that's just, it, it's a joke, okay? There are good landlords who are, you know, large, you know, huge landlords who own thousands of homes, and there are bad landlords who only own one or two houses, so you can't judge who a good or bad landlord is going to be based on the number of homes they own or if they are under an LLC or other corporation type, okay? The students are taking a course called Housing Systems taught by Professor Hayden Shelby. The course includes taking a look at the nature of housing problems and housing markets and addressing housing market failures. Looking at ownership patterns and how they relate to outcomes in the housing market is certainly worth a classroom exercise, but should policy interventions concentrate on who owns property? It depends on whether there can be a clear, consistent, and casual relationship between ownership and bad outcomes. So far, I have not found any data that establishes a connection. So yeah, he basically says right there, he hasn't found any data that says that, hey, corporate owners or private owners or anyone else, different ownership methods mean that the property is going to be better in terms of, you know, maintenance or evictions or whatever, okay? The only thing that, you know, the different ownership methods show is that a different type of entity or person owns the property. Now, I, I know for a fact, like, I, I own properties under my own name, okay? But I have a property manager who manages those properties. So my property manager probably has a much more corporatized way of managing them than I did as an individual. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, they might be a lot, f actually, I know they're a lot quicker to file eviction. I know they're a lot quicker to file late fees because they have systemized process. They manage hundreds of properties or thousands of properties. I'm sorry. They may actually manage thousands of properties throughout the city, right? And I only own a few of them, but they manage all of them in the exact same way. So I get the benefits of you know, all of the, you know, great accounting methods. I get the benefits of, you know, systems and processes put in place and, you know, all of their maintenance contracts, you know, which, you know, causes my maintenance to be less. And, you know, they, they, they handle it excellently. Okay. And I know property management isn't for everyone, but it is for me. And I'm glad that I moved to that because, you know, I just didn't have the time to dedicate to property management while working a full-time job and owning so many properties, okay? That that's the big thing. If I owned one or two other rentals, it would it wouldn't even be a problem. I can handle that all day, but I'm up to 16 units right now and it's just, you know, it becomes very troublesome with with that many units. So, you know, I I think that what I'm, I'm kind of going off on a tangent now, but the, the truth of the matter is the ownership method isn't what's important, okay? In fact, for a while, the big buzz was around foreign acquisition of housing in the United States. The scary narrative was that Chinese investors were parking cash in the American housing market, 
buying up lots of apartment buildings, emptying them out, and then waiting to sell them. About five years ago, there was a proposal to tax the purchase of housing by foreign investors to stop this. Yeah, and that, that's the thing. See, a few years ago, the scapegoat was foreign investors. Now we're up to, oh, the, the institutional investors are the scapegoat, you know, and uh, the corporate investors are the scapegoat, the hedge funds or whatever, right? And <laughs> whatever. It, it, soon it's going to just be, well, you know, it's the regular landlord. It's the out-of-state investor. It's a guy like me who owns a few properties in a different state. But, you know, whatever they think it is, they, they come after you hard. They pass laws to basically make it harder for you to do your business. And those laws end up hurting not just you as the landlord, but the tenants themselves. So that's why I always say, hey, we should fight against this sort of stuff. But I'm going to skip down a little bit in this article. And because uh, he makes up some good points right here in this next paragraph. There are bad housing providers and there are bad bus drivers, police, teachers, and maybe even politicians. But one doesn't try to attribute these actors' failings to something like where they live or where they went to school. If any one of these kinds of actors does something wrong, what makes sense is to sanction them for breaking rules or... Um, endangering the community. Such sanctions already exist for people who mismanage properties in a way that creates blight and the eviction process is presided over by a judge, not the housing provider themselves. And if rising rents are the issue, the best way to offset that is by creating a competitive housing market so people unhappy with the price can easily find a substitute nearby. That's right. You build enough housing, you create a competitive housing market. If your housing is substandard, those people will be like, well, you know what? For the amount I'm paying, I can just go down the street and get a better house and better quality for uh, the same price. So I'm out. OK, that's why we need more supply. And like this person said, the laws, the rules, the regulations to regulate bad la landlords, the bad actors, they're already in place. OK, we already have those rules. When they pass more rules, the only thing they're doing is restricting the, la the regular landlord, the good landlord's ability to make a profit. And what, what does that end up with? That means that a lot of people are going to get out of the rental property business. They're going to sell to owner occupants and there's going to be less rental properties available for those renters who really do need, okay, need it. So yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sick and tired of this, you know, calling the institutional investors or the corporate landlords or the out of state landlords, the problem in these cities. Okay. It's, it's too simple of a thought pattern. Okay. It has nothing to do with, well, the ownership method or where you live or not. Okay. Simply put, it has to do with you know, there not being enough supply for the number of people who want to rent. And that is greatly limiting what they can do in terms of, you know, um, the flexibility to move or find somewhere better to live.